You know who had uh, a better weekend than us and made a lot of uh, good decisions? Who? The Danimal. Ooh. Danimal. Dan Danielle Collins. We're going to get into it uh, in a little bit more depth because um, that I think that's the story from this week uh, in tennis is her continued dominance on the heels of Miami. Switching surfaces, no problem. Just running through the field again. Uh, ben Shelton, All-American final uh, down in Houston. Ben Shelton getting the win over uh, over Francis Tiafo. Francis need this, needed this result. Um, has been short on matches. Not his favorite surface. I actually think this is probably more significant at this part of the year uh, for, for Francis than it was uh, for Ben. Uh, obviously, Ben, first clay court title, uh, second title overall, first one in, in the States. Um, so not entirely unexpected, but for him, it's good to kind of get some wins on this surface. And now scheduling is going to be a, a thing. We'll see how much he goes over to Europe, how much he kind of uh, something that I've, I've talked about with Ben's father is like at some point, and we'll get into this further with scheduling, but you have to reset and maintain your physicality, right? There's tennis, which the tennis is there. He's playing well. He's on the job training, um, was kind of able to walk in and not have complete control over game planning, not have complete control over uh, intent behind each shot, uh, you know, shot selection, all these things. But the rawness of his game is so powerful that he kind of got into the top 15 uh, before he actually understands everything at his disposal and when and how uh, to deploy it. Um, so I think getting through matches like this, tough three setters on clay is, is going to serve him so well. Uh, moving forward for the rest of the year, but Francis needed to win some matches. Um, he, he had had a tough, and I, I love Francis. Uh, we're better when Francis is playing well, um, but, you know, I, I think he would tell you, uh, he'd have a bridge to sell you if, 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 if he thought that he was playing well to this point in the season. Um, hopefully we can, we can turn that right around, but always nice to see uh, two Americans in the finals of Houston. I wouldn't put <clears throat> too much stock and what happens in Houston, any tournament that I made finals of on clay, five years running, you can't give too much credit to. <laughs> um, you know, the, the Houston thing is it's great. You switch surfaces after Miami. Um, but essentially, it's it's a 250 event. You're playing against other Americans on clay, which is sometimes a liar's dice. And uh, maybe some players who are trying to sneak in a 250 and, before they go over to Europe. And over in Europe, starting uh, his clay court season uh, early, wildly early. Uh, Hubie Hercotch won his first clay court title. Um, doesn't get talked about enough. He's always kind of there in the top 10, top 15, you know, sneaks in the top eight, one of the biggest serves on tour. Nothing that he does well instantly translates to clay and is benefited by the surface. So for him to get through, uh, Kasper Ruud going down in the semis, uh, Hercotch beating uh, Martinez in the final, who great clay court player. I think that's good for him uh, on this surface. Uh, nice when you can break through and win. Uh, on the different surfaces, but back to uh, Danielle Collins. Mid-50s going into Miami before the first round is now 15 in the world. Wow. What a difference two and a half weeks makes. Um, ran, th But also, like, lost one set each of these tournaments. The first set she played in Miami and then ran through the draw. And the only set she loses in Charleston, I mean, she drilled the last two opponents. And she, I mean, she went through a tough draw, too. Bedosa, Jabour, and Jabour is the only one who won a set. Sloan Stevens, Sakari, Kazakina, beating Kazakina in the final one and two, uh, beat Sloan two and two, Sakari with straight sets. Um, I mean, the questions were, I'm always a fan of, after Miami, people go, is she going to pull out of Charleston? I go, if she's healthy, physically healthy, like mentally there's going to be a little bit of fatigue, you cannot choose when you play well. When you do, you max that out, I think. Now, it's going to be interesting to see what she does because there is such thing as going to Europe too early, um, especially from the States. So it'll be interesting to see what she does here. But, gosh, that turnaround from Saturday final, Tuesday in Charleston, and then just right through. I mean, the day she beat Jabour and Sloan, it had rained. She played both those matches in the same day, one against Jabour in the afternoon and Sloan at night and beat Sloan two and two. Sloan's won this tournament before. Uh, can't say enough good things about, about Collins. Um, I, I don't know if 
just her impending decision on this being her last year has just freed her up completely mentally. Um, the physical part of it is so convincing right now with what she's doing. She is just setting herself up right on the baseline and distributing, just throwing punch after punch after punch after punch. And the fun thing to watch when someone is playing as well as Danielle Collins is, you know, you, you hear a lot of, you know, pundits and commentators say, well, they step up on big points. It's like, I don't think it's like, a f like we would just do that all the time if it was a choice. Like, I don't think it's a choice. What I felt in those four or five pockets of like extended success where you're winning t a couple tournaments at a time um, is the ability, you know, you're at least going to play a good point. And if someone comes up with a good, it's too good, but you're going to make it an absolute pain in the ass, right? You're not going to miss second serve returns. You're going to move the ball around. Uh, they're going to have to come up with a winner. It's not that I know I'm going to win this point and I'm going to do it. You know, I'm going to step up and hit winners. No, I am so confident that I'm going to produce a quality point that they're going to have to produce something spectacular. They know it. I know it. That's what I think confidence is, is the ability to step up regardless of situation and simply play a quality tennis point. And when you're not playing well, maybe you do it 50% of the time under the gun. When you are playing well, you think you're going to do it 95% of the time. Now, it may not be a winner. <clears throat> it's not this flashy second serve, oh, go for it, hit a win. That's not, that's not it. It's literally racket speed, big cuts to big parts of the court. Danielle Collins isn't, I mean, if she hits on the line, it's kind of accidental. I mean, she pulled it or the, she's winning points. I've seen her hit more winners through the middle of one side of the court. Like you, you, people are having to guess whether she's going to hit a cross court down the line. Her margins are pretty safe. She's just hitting it so well, moving so well. She's not giving up the center of that court and is just distributing beautifully. It almost kind of like, that's what Andre used to do, right? It was like park himself on the baseline and he was just going to distribute when your air count goes down and your winners go up, normally tends to have a, a good effect, but uh, congrats to Daniel Collins. Let's see what happens with a change of scenery when you go to Europe. Is this two weeks going to be in a silo of the best two weeks of her career? Or is she? are we going to be able to get it, you know, go over to Europe and have it translate? You know, the feelings are different when you go over there. The clay is a little bit dustier. Uh it's a little bit more slippery. Um, we'll see. I mean, if she's hitting the ball this clean come come Wimbledon and can hit behind people, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to play her. I'll tell you that much right now. So, uh, props to 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 Danielle Collins. Um, as we see the tour transition from the hard to the clay, uh, you're going to see choices in scheduling. The next three weeks is going to be very apparent. You know, when I finished Miami, uh, when I stopped playing the Houston event. Uh, later in my career, you weren't going to see me for three weeks or a month. And it wasn't because I was on vacation. I was basically, I would go incredibly hard, like late November, December training. I would show up to Australia and I was normally in great shape. You know, I would maintain through Miami. Uh, you're playing a lot of matches, but in the gym, you're trying to maintain. And then Miami was over. I took the next three weeks and I would go back, maybe take you know, three or four days of rest I would stack it hard with fitness because I knew that that was going to be the cycle that kind of carried me through uh, Wimbledon. That's the way I thought. You're going to see people prioritize differently. A lot of players early in Monte Carlo. Casper Ruud started this week at Estoril. Like, he's going to play every clay court event because he should. You know, that's his Australia through Miami for me is this Monte Carlo through uh, Roland Garros. He's going to – you won't see him, you know, on a hard court after Wimbledon until he has to be on one. Um, but scheduling choice – uh, transition is going to be a little bit different. The people you see earlier in the clay court season are probably people who are a little bit more native uh, to the surface. Um, plenty of opportunity, though. Three, uh, three Master Series events uh, into Roland Garros. Uh, the long haul of the clay court season, there's going to be a lot of dirty socks, Mike Hayden.